Oh. Yeah, everybody. Hi, how's it going? This is Podcast 451, and that was a song to make it like we were doing an introduction. That was pretty fancy. Yay! Yay. <laughs> How technical are we? Oh, uh, pretty technical. I had to unplug and plug in my headphones. So I think we needed. I think we needed to kind of fade it a little bit more. It's it's got a. You didn't like the the hard stop. No. Oh, jeez. <laughs> We're just going to have to agree to disagree here. I'm, I'm okay. all about the hard stop. I am? Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome, everyone, to another riveting episode of Podcast 451, where Zoe won't burn your books unless you ask her to, because her last name is now Humpfires. <laughs> Due to a misspelling, which is quite amusing at the time. <laughs> I'm putting my glasses on so I look intelligent. Ooh, it's doing wonders. Thank should you. I, should I put some glasses on? I should. Have you got any? Yeah, they're, they're in the car that got um, repoed or something like that. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's pretty fancy good. talk for a mm. podcast, right? I don't think I can actually keep this on because I'm... Can everyone can see, see you? <laughs> I was going to say, look. You need to get glasses with no lenses in, so you look smart, but then they don't do anything. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Nice Hi. to be back again. Yeah, right? It's been like a whole six days. Yeah. What, what episode are we on now? Twelve? Yeah, I almost put ten, and then I'm like, maybe I should go on YouTube and just see what number episode wrong. Oh, well, don't tell people that. We're supposed to be really organized and know what we're doing. Well, we're kind of organized, and I know, um, again, I'm Creep Creeperson, and this is Zoe Humphreys, not Humpfires. <laughs> that's a different girl. <laughs> Just that's on my bad days. <laughs> Zoe Humpfires is an erotica writer from Essex. And, <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Zoe Humphreys here today. Um, but yeah, so uh, we're here, and um, you asked me a question, and then I started talking. Did I? Ah, who cares? Um, let me go on to the next thing I was going to say. <laughs> I forgot already. <laughs> um, for those of you who have been waiting for the audio episodes to go up, um, episodes one through five are up, and obviously I have a lot to do because we're on episode 12 right now, and I promised that episode 11 would be up today, and it's not. <clears throat> so um, I will get on those, but um, since we are still wrestling with iTunes at the moment, um, it's cool. So you could go to podcast451.com to look at past episodes. You How does that sound? Directly from the site, can't you? But it's not up on iTunes yet. Yeah. So how, it's how's your good. It, it's, it's been good. good. It's been a good week. Um, what, what have you been doing? Um, well, I've started illustrating the new Flasherton book. Yay! Yay! I've done 11 pages so far. Awesome. Which isn't too shoddy, is it? Not at it's all. That's good. Yeah. And what else have I been doing? Oh, waiting for my body warmer to arrive because it's so freaking cold in the studio. That was like an icicle, a human popsicle. <laughs> so now I've got my body warmer action going on. There's no stopping me. It's pretty nice. Yeah. Well, kind of. It does the job. I'm like a sleeping bag. With no sleeves. Yeah. Yeah. So I've still got full arm movement for activities in there. And she doesn't sound like <laughs> when she's walking. I do, a, I do a little bit, but I have to. I have to kind of walk like that. 
Okay. Yeah, that's okay. You you don't look ridiculous walking like this at all. No, not at all. I had an anniversary. Did you? You want to hear what kind? Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, yeah. I have been in this apartment for a year. Yay! Yay! And guess what? What? They still haven't put a goddamn plate on that light switch thing. <laughs> it's been a fucking year, and they haven't I done know, it. I know, it terrifies me, that thing. It's, oh. like, it's like an accident waiting to happen. Especially it's since different. the wiring is, like, from 1940, and, like, you could <laughs> see you're lucky. It, it looks, like, really scary. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, other than that... That's kind of cool. I can see some um, nice sack action going up on your shelves there. Yeah, I got the sack book. Well, that was a good point. And then I got yeah. sack, little sack. Awesome. I'm, I'm rubbing. Well, have, we got some <laughs> have we got some Slasherton news to be going on there? <clears throat> um, well, Slasherton and then just all the books in general. If you go onto Amazon right now through December... All of our books are on sale. So, like, when you do Cyber Monday tomorrow, you can go... Is this Cyber Monday? Yeah, it's like Black Friday, but what people do on the computer because they forgot to get shit, and so they're at work. Oh, is it a real thing? Yeah, it's the biggest shopping day online of the year. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, so... um. All the books are on sale. Most of them are 99 cents. There's one that's $1.99 because for some reason we can't get it any lower than that. Amazon won't let stitch. Us. Fuck, dude. I don't understand. Not I stitch. Have Is no it idea. stitch on sale? Stitch. It's stitch. I have no idea why that's like that. No, it's quite tricky, isn't it? You always <clears> think to like, evade our effort. Yeah. The stitch book is like... Just like Stitch, big and ornery. <laughs> so, um, so there's that. And then, um, <clears throat> let me see. Oh, on Christmas Day, okay, mm -hmm. there will be one free book. So, I mean, we have weeks to talk about this, but just keep in mind, when you open your new Kindle or your new iPad or whatever the hell device you get for Christmas and you want to get something, that was the worst <laughs> selling pitch I've ever done in my life. Keep we'll come back to that next week. <laughs> but, um, shameless and then, plug -in. Shameless plug-in. And then the last shameless plug is that um, Creepology oh, no. is almost done. I'm yeah. formatting it right now. So all the edits have been made, I hope. Um, I'm supposed to be doing the cover for your other one as well, Bloodlust Romance. You know what, though? I think, I think what I'm going to do with Bloodlust Romance, I think I'm going to um, have Bloodlust Revenge re-edited as well, and I want to put them out the same week. Oh, right, okay. So, that could be um, a bit of time, because I'm struggling to do the second drag, really. That's no, totally. And hopefully second what? drag will be done b before Christmas. That's yeah, it. well before Christmas, we're hoping. Yeah, so, um, so that's that. that. And honestly, as far as um, our writing goes, I need to, uh, with the exception of Slasherton, because Slasherton's really <clears throat> the only thing we have going on that seems to be working, mm. whether we want it to or not. You know, like, beyond our, I don't want to say stupidity, but lack of trying... <laughs> The Slasherton stuff is doing what it does, which is great. Yeah. That, that's yeah, what great. everyone hopes for, to have some sort of series that just kind of does its own thing and you just kind of sit back and watch it. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, I, uh, I was working a lot on these weird little short stories and little novellas and stuff, <clears throat> and I'm still going to do that. Um, like the okay. Creepology books. But um, I think what we need to do more to kind of secure um, a fan base and all this stuff is to really start one of the series that I want to do. Yeah. So whether it's Black Star Canyon or whether it's... Oh, and I started writing a new book. Should I talk about that a little bit? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, I'm doing a new series... 
um, called Shallow Jallo, and it's um, kind of like you're. you're <laughs> that's it's uh it's kind of a spoof on the Jally books, like that they would have in Italy, like the yellow covered mysteries and all that stuff that they started making all these Jallo films off of, and it's really like slapstick. <clears throat> spoof. So the first Jallo or Shallow Jallo tale is called The Girl with the Crystal Pubis. So um Which gives you a flavor. <laughs> but it's so good. It's got all the tropes in there just played out to the full. So it's yeah, really good. It, it's what I've heard so far. And it's, the it's and, and the the person that we follow you know how Agatha Christie had Miss Marple and that, what's his, his name, Perot? Pyro. Pyro? Pyro. Pyro? <laughs> like anyway, he, we know, uh, we know who he is. I know how to spell it, I just don't know how to say it. Um, our hero's name is Edwin Fenich. <laughs> <laughs> Crickets, <laughs> and um, and he's staying at the George Hilton in um Rome at the moment. So uh, oh, cool. yeah. So anyway, so that will be one series that I do. But those ones are kind of you could stand alone those things. There will be yeah. some that kind of go back and forth. But I really want to get back to getting Black Star Canyon done. Uh, yeah, I think you really should get into that. Yeah. Mm. But, um, and as a, just a little note as well, if you look up, um, what were the, what's the name of the covers to look up? Giallo? Mod Montadori. If you look up, uh, if you go on Google and Google Jolly Montadori, um, you'll see these covers that they've been making since like the 30s, and they're oh, still they're doing them so now. Oh, they're so good. <clears throat> and, um, the older ones are better. The older they? ones are awesome. The newer ones yeah, are kind of so good. But um, so yeah, we're we're totally gonna be aping that whole thing, and Zoe's gonna be doing some Zoe's amazing. Zoe's gonna attempt cover. it. She's she's already nervous about that. <laughs> she's Mom, trying to figure out how to do a crystal pubis. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, I'm trying to think of the ethics. But what's the term? Somebody tell me. Somebody told you what? No, somebody tell me. There's a name for it getting. Like diamantes and things, it's all attached to your pubic region, and it's called the. Oh God, what's it called? What are you talking about? The jazzle. That's it. The jazzle. The jaggle. The jazzle. You get the jazzle. Like the jazzle. Yeah, like but when, when you get holes down on your stuff. Yeah, the jazzle. It's the thing that in Essex, that's apparently what you do. That's where I'm from, right? <laughs> no, this is the county we're talking. Oh, okay. That's yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, the jazzle. Have we got any viewers? We got we have now. <laughs> I don't know how long they're going to stay. But... <laughs> it won't be now. I think I might have got this. <laughs> um, so there's that and then uh, let me see was there any other breaking news oh there is something um, I wanted to kind of pimp somebody's book so uh, can you see me right now or am I just a little round dot no I can see you oh that's amazing okay um, <clears throat> on I think December 5th I could be wrong you might want to check on Amazon for this right now or whatever but um, there is a book coming out called um, Write, Publish, Repeat. It's by um, Sean Platt, Johnny B. Truant, and David Wright. <clears throat> and um, What's it called? <laughs> Jim Likes Edwin. <laughs> and and Jim, wouldn't. Just patient, if you needed to know, I mean, he is a world-renowned opera singer, ballet dancer, Author, football player. Um, He's everything, isn't he? he Olympic gold medalist everything. diver. 
you know, <laughs> you name it, and Edwin's done it. So but he's based on you, isn't he? Or is no. He? <laughs> <laughs> and and he's dating a runway model from Milan. Of course. I'm Naturally. Sure he's not dating one either. Oh yeah. What's the name of that book? What book? Oh, right. Public repeat. Seen... Yeah. Sorry. Um, but yeah, it's these guys. Um, they do the self-publishing podcast, and um, they really um, kind of got me back into writing books, and um, uh, through listening to them and little emails here and there and everything, really learned a lot. And so this book is basically how to how to get your book out there and how to do it successfully. And I'm really excited for the book. So, um, again, it's called Write, Publish, Repeat. Um, repeat. Repeat. Like, do it again. I'm right. sitting on oh, a card yeah. and it's hurting my backside. Write, publish, repeat. So, oh, um, that why I, I, I think it. it comes out December 5th. I'm not 100% on that, but I think that's the date. So, um, just if you are a writer, for, write, publish my feet. So, like, write as in not wrong, publisher, <laughs> like a person, like the Oh wow! <clears throat> okay, so it's right yeah, like you're writing could... something, no, publish like you're oh. publishing something, and repeat like you're doing those two steps again. Yeah. Yeah, I've got it. Now. Smooth. That that's good. That's good. Um, I, I can't find it though. I'm here. Well, then it's not out until the fifth. Yeah, we obviously not put it up yet. I think if you go to selfpublishingpodcast.com. Slash WRP, no WPR. Um, <clears throat> there's info on it there, so I'm pretty excited yeah. about that book. I can't wait for it. Yeah, it'd be useful, definitely. Cause it's it's got gonna lots be of great. Stuff. Mm. They're really smart dudes, so um, it's really cool. And one of the greatest things about um, their show, um, Sean Platt and David Wright did the Yesterday's Gone series. Um, and they started this podcast with Johnny B. Truant, who had written one book, and it was not really that successful. <clears throat> and then over the last year, um, Johnny's been like kind of, you know, asking the right questions, picking the brain, doing everything to find out how um, Sean and Dave's Collective Inkwell has done what it's done, and now Johnny. Um, is very successful. We had him on the show. He wrote Fat Vampire, <clears throat> um, and he uh, co-wrote uh, Unicorn Western and The Beam with Sean. So um, it's just it's really neat to see somebody from going from not being that successful to being very successful in a year. Yeah. So um, right. great very, show. <clears throat> very helpful and. Um, What's the word? Inspiring. Mm -hmm. Very inspiring. So what's up now? What What's the next item up for bids? Well, you did good there. We've had a bunch of information there. I'm impressed. Yeah. You know what? I do want to say one more thing. If I could mm -hmm. um, toot... I don't know if tooting my own horns the right mm -hmm. word here, but I was going through edits of Creepology, and for those of you who don't know, it's all of the short stories that I published or little novellas this year, and um, there's an extra story in there called The Roommate, <clears throat> and The Roommate was one of the first little novella things that I wrote, um, and I wrote it back in like 2005, I believe, or 2006, mm -hmm. and I was like, I went in going, fuck, I'm going to have to like edit the shit out of this thing, I'm sure, because like I wasn't <clears throat> caring about how to write stuff and what was proper and all this other crap. And I was reading it and I'm like, okay, this is written in present tense third person. 
mm-hmm. and it was like kind of strange and weird. And I know that Bloodlust Romance is kind of like that too, but Bloodlust Romance explains why it's like that right at the beginning, but this one doesn't, and it just begins. And I was like, God, I don't know if this is going to work. And then as I read through it, because I haven't read it since fucking 2006, so I finished it, and I was like, holy shit. And I was like really kind of, hey, I did good. And oh. I, I I liked how it went, and it's really weird that it did that. And um, so I know, I know Jim writes. Um, how do you feel about, or anyone who's watching or whatever, how do you feel about first person or third person present tense like is that like a super weird like is does it like set you back when you read something like that anybody you talking to me or... I'm talking to you I'm talking to Jim I'm talking to anyone who may be listening a year from now I don't think, I think it, you know? no I think it it depends I think it depends on the style, once you start reading it, it depends on whether things grab you or not. You can't, you know what I mean? I wouldn't, wouldn't say it's particularly an easy, you know, I, like the most easy I, thing I to think, do, like, but. in, like, grammar, like, in literature, when you do yeah. third person, it's supposed to be past tense. Yeah. And again, like, um, I don't have all the answers at all, like... Well, it doesn't. It's not supposed to be anything, is it? It's just what appeals to what's easier for people to read a lot sometimes. But that's not necessarily the best way. Yeah. Sometimes it's nice to, you know, sort of mix it up a little bit and give someone something to think about. While I'm just trying to think it. of another book I've read that's like that, and I'm wondering yeah, if true. it's not done like that for a reason. Like, it's like second guessing, like, shit, do people not do this because it's really, really bad? You know what I'm saying? Well, as long as it's consistent, you're better off just putting it out there and seeing how people take it, I guess. Yeah. Well, so that'll be in Creepology, and that's the only other bit about that I wanted to talk about. Um, Yeah, yeah, it's a whole so, do you want to do um, our top five, or do you want to do what we've been reading? Um, are we going to do? Are you, have you got any what we've watched this week? Because I've only got Fringe. I haven't really oh. been watching shit. I watched yeah. two things, but I want to talk about that on Creepy. Yeah, you're going to talk. Okay, we'll skip so. that then. I've been. Well, I'm up to episode eighteen of season three now on Fringe, and it things are hotting up. Really good. I'm enjoying it. And um, what's really annoying about that is in hearing her talk about Fringe, I want to rewatch Lost, and that <laughs> will just eat up my entire fucking life, dude. So um, we had a discussion last night about it, didn't we? And you were like, oh, "God, we start talking about Lost and stuff." Because I only watched the first season of Lost and a bit of the second. And then I think it was out of scheduling and stuff, and the channel that was on. Jim might be able to help me out on that, but I think they swapped it onto Sky or something, and it wasn't available on Freeview over here. And I kind of lost track of it. Um, and my brother watched the whole thing. He watched it right through and he loved it, and he's like, oh, you're mental, why didn't you watch it? And I just didn't. Well, again, again, like last night we were talking. To, you know what? I don't know if we want to spend an hour talking about this. No, no, no. We'll skip. I got really time. pissed off, and um, because they knew when they when they started Lost, they didn't think it was going to go on forever. And then all of a yeah. sudden, they're like, "Oh shit, we're getting renewed. We need to come up with something." So the writers were like, Aah! and they're just writing a bunch of shit. And then they're like, "Oh, we're going to get canceled." Oh shit, what do we do? Well, what, how are we going to end it? Let's just end it like that. So there's so many things, like questions left unanswered, but the answer is is like they did it because they didn't know what else to do kind of thing. And so like as a viewer, I feel kind of ripped off, but at the yeah. same time, like it was a really good show. Yeah, but, I know exactly what you mean now. But the um, I've been this. I told I mentioned this last week, but I've been listening to the Fringe podcast, which is so in depth. I skip over a lot of them and just listen to the episode ones because there's all sorts of feedback ones and interviews and stuff like that. And because I'm on the third season now, I kind of just want to hear what they've said about each 
episode and things they might have picked up on and series and stuff like that. But it's actually starting to like, I still like it. I still like listening and hearing the views on it, but a lot of it is just their uh, thoughts on it. And I'm getting annoyed now because I know what actually happened. I'm thinking, well, no, that's not right. <laughs> blah blah blah, and and also I'm getting so confused trying to look out for things, but I'm missing what the hell is going on. So why don't you why don't you finish watching the show, and then yeah, listen to the, the thing the podcast. Yeah, I think yeah. I might do that. I do enjoy it. It is great, and there are like loads of things that you know make it more interesting. But it's interesting to hear all the things that JJ Abrams connects things to, you know, and his interesting stuff that he fits into every series he does in various different ways. What, a plane crash? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a few things with that, but there's also like the um, Wizard of Oz, he loves the Wizard of Oz, so there's a lot of that in it, and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's quite interesting, definitely, but it's a bit overwhelming, the amount, especially for my goldfish brain, it kind of like, there's only so much it can hold in there at one time. <laughs> Which makes me laugh a bit. I just sort of sit there, like, getting confused. But the series is great. I'm loving it. And I finally finished Breaking Bad, which just blew my mind. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say anything, obviously, yeah. but, oh, I don't know what to do with myself now. And I've watched the whole thing as well. I've watched up to, um, like, the halfway through the fifth season twice. And then obviously watch the final thing. So it's kind of like I don't know what to do with myself. I think I'm gonna to have to watch the whole thing again at some point. Well, Jim just answered me and said, "I like that tense. It has a good dynamic for some stories." Well, there you go. I can't. I just That's can't good. think of a, a story that does that. I'm sure there will be. No, I'm sure there people, are. Yeah, I just but. Don't Read as much as other people do, I guess. Or the shit I read isn't like that. You don't um, have time to read mostly, do you? You're too busy running around doing all sorts of other cool stuff. Well, I don't want to be like Garth Marini over here, but, you know, <laughs> like. You kind I'm, of I'm the only author who's written more books than I've read. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's me. Shall we go on to um, book reviews? Yeah. And I just, I just want, I just want a high five for a dark place reference. Yay! Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, let's hit the reviews. Do you want to go first? Um, I can do. This one, I was I found it quite tricky this week to decide because I was going to go for reference and then I thought, no, I did that last week. I think. No? I can't remember yes, what I did. did. You did this, the Book of the Dead. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. And the week walk. before. Pardon? I'm going to go for a walk. So I'm going to click on you and I'm going to go for a walk. Keep talking. Okay. Right, everybody. The book this week I'm going to go for is... <clears throat> this one called The Trickster by Muriel Gray. I'll be interested to see if Jim's read this. Um, I just want to point out that Creep is in the kitchen, not the bathroom at this point. I can see him. <laughs> just in case anyone was slightly worried it was getting a bit x rayed. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry about that. He's in the kitchen. Okay, this Muriel Gray, you'll be interested about this, is um, she's a Scottish um, author, broadcaster and journalist from East Kilbride in Scotland. And she started off as like a professional illustrator and she went to like the, she was a museum curator or something for it and design, she did all sorts of stuff. She actually um, interviewed on the tube quite a bit that we were talking about. The tube? Yeah. She was on there. She's like got platinum yeah. blonde hair. Um, and sort of... It's not the one who was married to Bob Geldof. 
to really broad Scottish, so that might have been the one that you were asking me about. The chick who I could not understand the word she was saying. That's probably her. She's got like a very narrow face and like a pinched nose. Totally. Yeah, that's probably her. She's got a really broad Scottish accent. Um, but anyway, she, this is her first novel from, let me just look up my notes here, 1995. And it's been, I, I don't know if anybody's read this. Jim, if you've read it, I'd be interested to hear about it. But it's, I just read it by pure chance um, a while ago now, so I can't remember great thing, you know, a lot about it, but it was really got me. It was a really dark sort of chilling sort of story. Very similar to Stephen King kind of stuff, but without all the huge sort of detail that Stephen King goes into. All, you know what I mean? He tends to go over the top sometimes with things. And this was really like bleak and dark, but a really exciting story that's like keeps going the whole way through and keeps you tense. I'll read the back. It says, um, he is a shape shifter. He's all his time. He kills without mercy. Life is good in silver at a small town high in the Canadian Rockies. Sam Hunt is a lucky man with a loving family and an honest income. He has everything he wants. But beneath the mountains, a vile demonic energy is gathering strength and soon it will unleash its breathing terror upon silver. In the eye of the storm, one man struggles to bury the private horrors of his childhood. He knows nothing, yet seems to know everything. Sam Hunt, that's the copy machine, not... In the toilet. <laughs> That's not on the back of it. All he loves may be destroyed by an evil beyond imagining, an evil from the buried hated past, an evil named the trickster. And it's just, it's really good. Except the reviews on the back of the trickster begins with a blood curdling scream and maintains the horror for over 500 pages. It's actually 720 or something. It's, it's a good thick book, but you rattled through it, I did anyway. The trickster is very good indeed. Grey tells his tale with immense elan. A smashing debut that's got to you than most authors could ever be. That's time out. And the trickster is written with incredible vigour. Thuggish, gory, sentimental, cosy. It grips. That's the daily now. So it's one of those, and what I like about these things as well is it's set in a really nice, I love like mountainous wilderness and settings, you know, I love that kind of um, outdoorly feel to it, and this sort of oppression that's taken over like a lovely, cosy little place, if you know what I mean. And it's just, I can't remember a huge amount of, about the story, like I said, I might actually read it again, because I just staggered across it when I was looking for something to review today, and I thought, oh god, that was brilliant, I remember it like sticking in my head and it being really sort of enjoyable. I can remember not being able to put it down. So I might read it again actually because I hardly read my them in other books. Which Jim, has, Jim re has read that by the way. So what did you think of it Jim? You can agree, disagree with me if you want. I won't be offended. I just really enjoyed it. I, I think it appeals to me. I think it's the outdoory and this kind of um, unknown evil, you know, that's lurking there and just gets bigger and bigger and bigger the threat all the way through it. It's great. And she's also written two other novels called she might have written more by now, but the ones I found were The Ancient and Furnace, which I think I might have read those as well, but I'd have to remind myself. But they're, they're really good. So, that's my book for this week. Muriel Gray, The Trickster. Nice. Quite neat, isn't it? Let me click on you. Is it like a what is that wrapped around him? Kind of like shimmeringness. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's really good. It's sinister. Wow. It's got like a really nasty sinister feel to it that you don't get with the, you know. A lot of books have the sort of ideas behind it, but they don't actually get you, whereas this one got me. So there you go. I'm looking forward to see what Jim says. Get typing, Jim. There is a bit of a delay on here. Um, okay, here we go. Jim says... Uh, can you see it? 
Yeah, no oh, way. Okay. It says she also wrote a great short story called How do you say that? About human sacrifices. Shy talk. <laughs> Shy talks yeah. about human sacrifices in a rubbish dump. Oh my god, that sounds off. I'm going to have to look that up. <laughs> Tell me what you thought about this one, Jim. Can you remember? This is really weird how this is doing this right now. What is it slow? No, if I um, click on a comment to show up on the screen, it deletes it after I do it. Oh, does it? Yeah, I don't know why. I'll just read it out. Yeah, I'll just read it out. Um, yeah. I'm really getting absolutely annoyed with all the things. Um, he said, I liked it. Her second novel was good, too. Yeah. So there you go. Awesome. You need to <clears throat> check it out if you haven't. It's, it's just a... I, I mean, have it's not. not. There's nothing, like, outstanding. It's not like one of those, uh, you know, one of these books that will be remembered in the eons of time, but it was just a really enjoyable, genuinely scary, chilling read, you know what I mean? Well, and we going to... We're going to have a little discussion later, aren't we, about female authors and things, so she might crop up in there. Well, I was just going to say, if you want to talk about a book that won't be remembered in the eons of time, I have one for you. Okay. Don't worry, we'll discuss it. Oh! There it is. <laughs> okay. See, that just gets me so excited. Just even I like know, that. you get all excited. Okay, so this is uh, Jason X, The Experiment. <laughs> Um, by Pat, what is it, Cadigan. Um, now, here's the thing. Like, as you might know, me and Zoe are doing the Friday the 13th podcast, and um, that's at Friday the 13th podcast.com. But um, I've just been getting, like, super geeked out on all sorts of Jason stuff. Oh, and so um, oh, this good. book was, like, a dollar on Amazon, so I thought I would get it and give it a read. There's um, <clears throat> four books that um, I guess take place after the events of the film Jason X, which a lot of um, Friday the 13th fans and Jason fans don't really like. I love it. I think that movie is so I much fun. I can't um, wait to review that one. This book is uh, so far um, really fucking boring. And that breaks my heart. Um, let me read the back to you, because it sounds great. It says, In the far future, Jason Voorhees has been resurrected as an invulnerable monster. Did I do this before, or did I just read this to you one time? I don't know. You might have done it last time. I don't think you did. Are you sure? Oh, well. You might have done it before. Carry on. Just tell um, me. Anyway, so military scientists keen to create unstoppable super soldiers are anxious to utilize Jason's regenerative powers and killer instinct. But Jason is no lab rat and escapes into an underground complex to continue his murderous mission. The scientists will soon find out, to their horror, that evil cannot be harnessed and cannot be stopped. Full of futuristic thrills, action, and good old-fashioned slasher mayhem, Jason X the Experiment proves there's only one thing worse than an unstoppable killer. Two of them. Dun dun dun. So um, this this uh, book promises me that it's full of futuristic thrills, action, and good old fashioned slasher mayhem. Mm -hmm. So far, this book is worse than Twilight. Oh, I've I'm read like pages and pages of pages of this girl who I guess is the main character talking about the future and her car and her school and her hopes and dreams and aspirations and all sorts of shit that I don't give two fucks about. <laughs> A wise man once said, I can't have sex with your college degree and I can't put my fist in your childhood dreams. And that's exactly how I felt reading at the beginning of that book. I really wish you wouldn't come out with quotes like that. I'm sorry, people. 
very sorry. You have to bring my tone down. But I understand but the sentiment behind it. Seriously, it was just like, it was just going on forever. I felt like I was reading, like, I know. the diary of, like, a 14-year-old girl. It was just yeah. like, and I'm not trying to be a dick, but all I want to do is... Just get to the killing and the... Action. Not even just get to the killing, just get to because the the first to Jason, the, the more. preface opens up with Jason's what's left of Jason's body being at the bottom of the lake oh, on okay. Earth two, and that there's two nanites left inside of them that start reconstructing them. Yeah, you see, I love that concept. Yeah, That's great concept, and that chapter was really good, but it was mm -hmm. like a page and a half, and now this chick's driving a car. And I'm like fucking bored out of my mind. You just and have to keep at it, I think. I know, but I'm telling book. you, like it's it's a long book. It's like 450 fucking pages or some shit. And not that that's like out of control, but I mean, when the first 30, like you know, I'm sitting there on the toilet like a normal human being, trying to read a book, and um. You know, I go in there two or three times, and I'm still reading about this girl's hopes. You know, like I, just I need to just give it a little bit more. Time. I mean, I'm gonna give it a little bit more time, obviously, but and so that got me thinking, because I'm like one of the few people in the world, I guess, that don't like Anne Rice. I don't like. No, Ashley I don't Rose. like her either. Okay, well, me and you are two of the few people on earth that don't like her. Um, and then I was like going through my books on my shelf. I'm like going, okay, well, this book is written by a female, obviously, okay, mm -hmm. and um, is which is though? fine. It might, yeah, it, it, no, no, I checked because Pat is very. Um, yeah. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, ambiguous. Ambiguous, yeah. But um, sure as shit, Pat's a girl, and um, I was just trying to think. I'm like, what? authors do I like that are girls that don't write smut? Mm. You know? Because I'm yeah. thinking of girl authors that I know, and a lot of them write like erotica and stuff like that. So I'm yeah. like, okay, well, obviously I'm not talking about erotica. That's for a whole different purpose. I'm just trying to find something that I like to read. And um, I can't think of any. And I know there's got to be some good girl authors out there, and you said you have one, right? Well, I was thinking about this, and I know that the, the, the famous ones that I came up with off the top of my head was Shirley Jackson, who did The Haunting of Hill House. Okay. Susan Hill, who did The Woman in Black, and she's done loads of ghost stories, which are... I mean, Susan Hill... Have you read that movie. book? Yes. Yeah. I have, and is I enjoyed it. Is it as good as the ITV production? Um, yeah, I would say so. I'd say it's better. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because I was terrified. No, because I sound so stupid when I say that. Well, is the ITV... book better than the made-for-TV movie? Yeah, the made-for-TV movie is awesome. Did you enjoy it? I liked it a lot, actually. It was good, wasn't it, atmospheric-wise? It was really good. Um, and I've got George Eliot, who was actually a pseudonym for uh, Marianne Evans, who wrote the classic Middle March, Mill on the Floss, Adam Bede, and if you're into that kind of thing. And I read all those years ago, and absolutely, I loved Middle March. It's like a proper like emo, and you know all that kind of. But it's not soppy like that. They're quite like so complicated and, you know, intricate with all the different characters and it's quite sort of, it's different, it's quite sort of, um, what's the word to say, it's like empowering really, she was like totally different for her time and yeah. obviously yeah. Her, her views about women and all that kind of thing were kind of very different so she had to write it as a, as a man otherwise she wouldn't have been allowed to do it really. Um, Mary Shelley, obviously, was another one. And Harper Lee, I've got, who wrote Kill a Mockingbird. Agatha Christie. Yeah. 
Agatha, Christ- no, Agatha Christie's obviously like. Have you heard of Iris Murdoch? No. Iris Murdoch. I've only read The Black Prince, and that was years ago. And she's incredible author. It's like really sort of intellectual, not intellectual like. So it's unapproachable, if you know what I mean. It's quite philosophical and. What about yeah. what about um Poppy Z Bright? Don't know. Never read that. Okay. They're the ones that I came up with. What about Daniel Steele? Not my kind of bag. <laughs> it's your mum's, isn't it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I can remember, we have a an author over here, Jilly Cooper, she's called, who does all sorts of ridiculous, well, I shouldn't say ridiculous, because they're so massively popular. But they were like, um, sort of smutty kind of novels about, they were all sort of based around horse riding and about, you know, all that kind of type of people. You know, in jockers and the upper classes. Here's another question. How come when a girl writes something smutty, it's like like all right and romantic and like cool, but when a guy does anything like that, he's a pervert? Well, it goes the, it's the opposite. For if a girl sleeps around, she's a slut, and if a boy does, he's like a hero. So you could look at it both ways, couldn't you? Okay. That sounds fine. Whatever. Yeah. But I know what you mean. I think I'm, I personally don't. I, I tend to go for male authors just for some reason. I'm not. I have read some which are quite like, but you can you can tell quite a lot. Oh my god! I totally forgot. I did see two things that I wanted to bring up. What? That go on with this. I watched two documentaries. Um, okay. Oh, yes, you did. One was the Salinger documentary um, Uh that's on Netflix about J.D. Salinger, which was amazing because there was a ton of shit that I just did not know, and um, it was really, really good. I highly, highly recommend everyone check that out. And then another one that has been in my queue for months, and I just was like, I don't want to watch it. I kind of do, but I kind of don't. And then after watching the Salinger one, I was left wanting more. Um... I uh, watched um, New York in the 50s, which is about, like, the writer scene in New York um, back in the 1950s, and it was just great. It was so good. Was so, it? Uh, yeah, it was so good. <clears throat> so if you... I don't know uh, if we have that on the UK one. I'll have to have a look. Oh, you got to find it. It's really, really good. Um, the cool thing about um, the uh, one on Salinger that I didn't know, like, everyone knows after he wrote Catcher in the Rye and it became this huge hit, he just kind of like vanished off the face of the earth, basically. Um, But he has a trust and he died a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And starting in 2015, they're going to start releasing the books that he had been writing for the past 30 years. And um, in some of those books is a sequel to Catcher in the Rye um, more books about the Glass family, um, and some of the stuff it almost sounds like was getting into like spiritual stuff, like his um, like Buddhist kind of beliefs and stuff like that. But um, we're gonna get more Holden Caulfield and more of the Glass family, and between 2015 and 2022, I think. So, um, that's, that's really, really exciting. interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's really cool. So you saw that on the documentary then? That yeah. Be doing that. You haven't seen that anywhere else? Oh, wow. You'll have to look out for that then. Yeah, and if anyone knows, I mean, I don't even know if anything's leaked out or anything like that. So if it has, you know, hit yeah. me up. I would love to take a look at that. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Right. How are we doing viewers? Have we got any comments? Um, just that Jim said he read that. We're doing great. Read what? Keep it going. Keep it going. He read the book you were talking about. Oh, right. 
Shockingly, I don't think Jim has read any of the Jason X books. <laughs> Not yet. Will now. <laughs> You're missing out, Jim. Well, apparently not. <laughs> apparently I might, I might just skip this chapter and go to the next one and see what happens. I would. I don't think you'd be missing out. I think you'd be able to catch up on the plot somehow, don't you? Eh. I read the back of the book. I'm pretty happy. Yeah. I would think so. I have a feeling it'll get to some good stuff. I think it'll just be it's some... Better, dude. <laughs> oh, I was going to say. Sorry, Lolly. Lolly's her pet boa constrictor. <laughs> I disturbed her. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention that we do from the Friday the Thirteenth podcast. I mentioned these two books, which are the Tom Savini Grand Illusions, Grand Illusions books <laughs> one and two. Yeah, it's Grande Illusions. It's like a size at Starbucks. Wrong. There he is, the fluffy. Which one is he? <laughs> Good one. <laughs> okay, for those of you who um, can't see the video, um, she's showing me pictures of Tom Savini right now. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, sorry. I just keep forgetting to do the um, order as well. Um, and basically, it's just if you haven't got these, they're quite difficult to get hold. You can find them on Amazon and eBay and stuff like that, but they're not like I don't think they're in print all the time. These are all versions that I managed to find, and they're basically the notes actually written. It's written by Tom Savini, and he just tells you all his little tricks of how he does stuff, but it's in a really simple way. Um, you know, step by step things. And sometimes when you if you like special effects like me and you kind of um try to look up things and try to work out how to do stuff, because you'd be surprised how complicated there's so many different versions of people doing things different ways. It's quite nice to have like a simplified way of doing it, if you know what I mean. And he does like teeth and fangs, but it's like in the most because he had like a knack of doing things kind of DIY and making it up as you go along, it kind of appeals to that side of you. It's the sort of things that you might have handy rather than, obviously not everything, but it's not requiring all the really high tech stuff that you would use now so much. And it's just really useful. And he's done loads that he basically goes through all the films that he's done. Um, Death Dream, Derange, Martin, Dawn of the Dead. Then he does casting ahead, colour plates of various films that he's done. Friday the 13th, Maniac, I the Stranger, what? The Burning, The Prowler, Freak Show, what? Um, Jim, I'm sorry. Jim uh, said, I did start reading that Pat Cadigan Jason book, but never finished it. Read more like it was written by Flat Cardigan. <laughs> There you go, you see. I totally agree okay. with it. Yay, I'm not crazy. No. Um, and he's actually, he actually goes through in the second book, um, Two Evil Eyes, Night of the Living Dead, 1990, which is really interesting. Trauma, Killing Zoe, which I didn't realise he did. Mystic. And it's just great. It's great to actually have his notes of the film and how we did all the effects in it and I used that in our first episode um, but if you're into that kind of thing it's a great book so look them up Grand Illusion Grand Illusion Grand Grand Illusion from Sabina I just wanted to mention those because I had them beside me from the extensive note making that we did okay yeah. Are we yeah. moving on to top five? I think we are. Excuse me, I'm just having a drink of my diet coke. Ooh, ooh la la. Why don't <laughs> you take it? No, I came up with it this oh, okay. week. Okay, so I'm going to go. Top okay, five. I had it. Oh, go ahead. Hang on, hang on. It's our oh. top five 
favorite math scientists slash inventors? In literature. Um, literary, yes. Yeah. yeah. In literature. So, Creep's been complaining about this since I did it for some reason. So, I'm obviously going to be better at it again. Carry on. Okay, first <laughs> off, let me just say that I am not complaining about it. It's just the people that I wanted to pick, the more I like dove into it, I'm like, these they don't really count. And I've been trying to stay away from comic books because... Yeah, I tried to as well. You want to go there. And so mm -hmm. um, uh, I have a couple comics, so... That's okay. First off the bat, I'm going to say Bruce Wayne. Because, yeah. um he has a fucking cave, and he builds shit, and is all creepy and weird, and just kind of keeps to himself. And honestly, <clears throat> Batman has every fucking capability of being a supervillain. Like well, he's a human, and that's pretty awesome. It's just he is like, oh, he's like a a step away from just, like, losing his mind and being, like, yeah. the most insane bad guy who ever lived. So Yeah, he's right on the cusp of it all the time, isn't he? Mm -hmm. but, that, but the whole thing about it, the whole gothic darkness behind it makes it so cool somehow. It's just, the way it's done is nice because it's, like... Yeah. It's like an old universal monster. Yes, that's exactly it. An and the fact that he's down in... Tale. And yeah, it's... the fact he's down in a cave with fat and it's all dark and he's inventing things. It is just the equivalent of, you know, sort of like a Bela Lugosi or, you know what I mean? Yeah, for real. It's really good. I love it. Oh, can you imagine if they, if the timing would have worked out and they made a Batman movie in the 30s? Oh, that would have been awful. <laughs> it would have been so bad. It wouldn't have been great, but you never know. <laughs> and Bella Lugosi playing Batman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. That would have been awful. Okay, go ahead. What's your number five? You could kind of do it now in a 30s style. That would be interesting. Wouldn't it? Oh, uh, I, can I just say, if I'm ratty tonight, my dog is irritating the life out of me. I don't know so what funny. is up with her. Hmm? Oh, you have your headphones in, so she won't be able to hear me. She's just standing looking at the back door now, and she's been out twice. It's very irritating. So anyway, what's your number five? Okay, my number five. I've gone for quite... I tried to pick, there's some of them that are very well known, but some of them I've gone as kind of obscure as I could think or find. But I thought they'd just be interesting. Okay? So my first one that I'm going for is Emmerich Velasco. Do you remember him? No idea. He's from The Haunting of Hell House or Hell House. That was written in 1971 by Richard Matheson, and he was basically he was the guy who was given ten thousand ten million dollars. He was left ten million dollars by his parents, and he invented he built the mansion, and he basically built it to terrorize, to put people in, and to carry out cruel experiments and psychological torment and stuff. Have you seen that? You know the legend of Hell House. Yeah. The haunting yeah. of Hell House, sorry. Um. And it's, but he managed to achieve all these things, and the best thing was, he achieved the mad scientist status more so than anybody else because he continued to terrorize people even when he was dead, and that's quite something. Can you remember in the house, he manages? To, can you not remember the story of it? Uh -uh. He basically, gets it. He proves the. I'm finding it very difficult to concentrate because Doris is scratching around in the kitchen for one little measly biscuit that dropped out of a bowl earlier behind stuff. 
Anyway, I'll try and concentrate. He, <laughs> I'm really sorry, he basically gets people in there, psychics and things like that, to channel his spirit and all the different things that are going on in the house. And he just torments them until they all kill themselves in various different ways. And the first time it happens, everybody dies. And then the second time, Roddy McDowell, he's the only one who survives it. And they force him to kind of go back to try again to solve the problem of it all. And he works it all out. The but character <coughs> name in the book is Roddy McDowell? No. I can't remember his name in it. But this is... <laughs> But Emmerich Belasco is the evil genius behind it all, who's built this entire mansion for this purpose. Why are you laughing? This is a very valid point. It is. It's cool. <laughs> In order to terrorize and basically drive all these people mad. And he actually is dead, but he still manages from the grave to terrorize all these people again and to drive them insane. And it's all psychological experiments and torture which I think is quite cool. And he was like a scholar, you know, name and a huge academic genius with everything he did before he died. So I thought he would count. That is cool. Yeah. Well, try not to look too impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so what about Neil? Have we only got Jim watching? Because who and Jim get dragged into all our arguments. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so anyway, so uh, my number four is the polar opposite of Bruce Wayne and is Tony Stark because he's oh. an awesome scientist who has fun. I was fun totally going to have Tony Stark. Does all sorts of fun stuff. It's like if I were to be a mad scientist, I would really you hope know. I would be a lot like him. I would hope he'd like be a lot, be a lot like him, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We've talked about Tony Stark and Bruce Wayne. Tony Stark is like the ultimate, isn't so, he? Yeah, he's great. But he's got everything about him. It's not just the inventor genius, you know what I mean? He's got the wealth, all the, the looks, the everything. And in the 80s, he had that creepy little Wayne Newton mustache. So, yeah. We're rocking it. Mustaches are very rarely creepy in my book, apart from maybe Hitler. Because <laughs> Charlie Chaplin's was so sexy. Okay. <laughs> no, it wasn't creepy. Oh, he was a bit. Okay. Carry on. Yeah. So what's, what's your number four? Oh, my number four is The Invisible Man. Have okay. you picked him? No. Go ahead. Yep, the, the Invisible Man that was written by H.G. Wells in 1897. Um, and I've always liked The Invisible Man. I, I had loads of choices for this and I couldn't decide what else. I'll tell you my honourable mention. But I go for The Invisible Man partly because he... I think it was just the whole thing behind it. He was so flawed and so really mental and it just got worse and worse and worse to the point totally. that he couldn't, yeah it was like he was totally out of control that's and I like that about that. it that's such a yeah. good book I love it I know it's an awesome book and it's just it's the whole idea behind it is he's absolutely consumed by it and that but he's also achieved the most incredible thing and the film is so good as well to back it up, and I love that. You know, the, the effects and everything were incredible yeah. for the time. So everything about the whole concept of him is great to me. And it has Uno O'Connor in it. Yes. Oh, love her. She's awesome. very Dickensian, right? Yes. Yeah. She is. Screechy She's Dickensian. Great. I love her. <laughs> She's a character, um, all right, that's for oh, sure. Oh, my God. Um, well, my um, number three is The Invisible Man. So, ah. uh, now, I like this 
first off because it's just a really good book and mm -hmm. it's one of those books that isn't super long so you could like read it over and over again like right off the bat <clears throat> and um, that's kind of what I did with it but um, it's just like the fact that you know like the road to heaven is paved with good intentions you know like that whole thing like he wasn't necessarily trying to be an evil asshole no. he was trying to do something good but the power that came with it completely confused just started making him fucking go batshit crazy and yeah. um it's just it's such a good read and, and the movie, of... movie is great i mean yeah. um but the book is just it, it's hard to not see Uno O'Connor in every fucking scene in that book when you read the book. If you've seen the yeah, movie, can you read the book. Um, but it's just, it's so good, dude. It's like, yeah. and he gets so vicious. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll just be talking, it's fine. Um, Griffin, yeah, psychopath and nudist. Sorry exactly. about that, she didn't. She didn't even want to go out. I'm going to stab her. Jim just said, ah, Griffin, genius, psychopath, and nudist. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and it's just, you know, he picked the wrong time of year to fucking, um, totally you did. know, go invisible. But um, Well, kind of, but it was from a visual point of view. It was the only time of year that we could have really seen what was going on, wasn't it? Yeah. So, but yeah, that's mine. Yeah, I totally agree. Fantastic. Now, H.G. Wells, and just real quick, H.G. Wells was like a fucking prophet. Oh, completely. So if you haven't That's read really any genius. of his stuff, like um, The Island of Dr. Moreau or uh, The Time Machine or anything like that, um, it's a, he's a really good read. So Yeah, it's so good. Okay, continue. I'm sorry. My third one... Tim's going to appreciate this one. I know he will because we've discussed this on Facebook. Not recently, a while ago. But it is Abner Perry. Now, Abner Perry, you won't recognize his name straight away. No, I won't. He is, but he is the inventor or the professor who invents the iron mole, which is the huge machine-like drill that goes down into the center of the earth, which is At the Earth's Core, which is a book that, it's, the film is called At the Earth's Core, and it's from the book At the Earth's Core by Edgar Rice Burroughs, that was written in 1914. And I don't know if you've seen it, but it's absolutely awesome. And it's, he's played by Peter Cushion in the film, and it's one of my favorite cheesy films, which I've actually got, just bear with me, I've got my, Sorry if you got a bum shot there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> can you see that? Yeah. And you can actually see the iron molar coming out of the earth. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah, it's awesome. And what's even more awesome, everybody, I'm sorry about this, I'm showing them the cover of the DVD. The effects are a little bit shoddy in some places, but apart from that, it has Peter Cushing, Doug McClure, who is one of my heroes, and Carolyn, Caroline or Carolyn Munro, who is a stunner in it. And they basically go down, cut through the earth, but of course it goes slightly off hill, off hill, off core, and they end up in this strange world um, with dinosaurs and monsters and a huge rid of people who are like trapped and terrorized by these other people and they have to rescue Carolyn Monroe who's gorgeous. And it's one of my cheesiest, ridiculous movies and I absolutely love them. The Doug McClure ones because I used to watch these with my granddad when we were little. And my granddad used to love all these. It was hilarious. And he got me into all the crappy, there's just 
unbelievable, but he invented that. And when you watch it, it's just, it's like a sort of torpedo with a huge metal drill on the front that burrows down into the earth's core. And these cushions just, you don't need to describe them, but he invented it, so I thought he would deserve a Victor eccentric Victorian scientist. And he's actually, yeah, a Dr. Abner Perry, Peter Cushion. So there you go. If you haven't seen that, people, watch it. It's I have incredible. not. <gasps> have you not? Mm -mm. It sounds it's familiar, that. but it sounds like there's a couple other things that are kind of like there's that. The Land That Time Forgot as well with Doug McClure, which is the one where they're in the submarine and they end up surfacing in this weird other land with dinosaurs sure. and stuff. That one's awesome yeah. too. Know that one good. Yeah, well this is very similar. They're really good. They, they just remind me of my granddad and they're awesome and he was always... I know. And he's really Peter Cushing in it, like your classic, you know, with this when his hair goes mad, you know, when he's really stressed and it sort of goes all crazy and skew with and he's got his little gold rim specs on and stuff and a little suit. And he's just awesome in it, so... Like when he has my bed head and my hair's yeah. all... Like that. Yeah. It's sort of so neat and grill cream back normally, but it goes totally. And he, he attacks people with his umbrella and all that kind of stuff. It's just brilliant. Oh, that sounds He's awesome. Have, yeah, it really is. So that's my number three, Abner Perry. Well, that, you know, my number two is um, uh, Dr. Jekyll. Now, the problem mm. with this is. Um, Everyone knows, like, when someone goes, oh, that guy's super Jekyll and Hyde, you know, da 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 talking about, like, their mood swings or anything like that. <clears throat> and it's such a known thing that the book is almost not fun anymore because the book is like a big twist. Like, when you yeah. find out at the very, very end that Jekyll and Hyde are the same person. And yeah. how it starts out is... <clears throat> this lawyer guy finds that um, this Dr. Jekyll has um, changed his will to leave everything to this Mr. Hyde guy, and the lawyer assumes that he's been bamboozled or had by this guy. So he starts investigating Hyde, and um, <clears throat> all this shit, craziness ensues, blah, 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 blah. Um, and the reason why he created this serum or potion or whatever in the first place was to um, do something to where he could be a better person by letting the bad side of him kind of run wild every once in a while. You that's, know? What, that's what I love about it. The fact that the Victorian sort of idea of things, you have to be so straight-laced and, and he, had, he knew he had these dark this darkness in him, and he thought if he could get that out and let that be done with. The thing that kind of pisses me off is that it's it's almost the same premise as that shit movie, The Purge, that <laughs> um, I fucking hate so much. Yeah, <laughs> but I, um, so. I see what you mean when you're saying that. Yeah, but it's just like it. The dude means well, and that's how so many of these mad scientists type of people start. They mean well, and then shit yeah, gets out of control. And um, if, you haven't, control. if you haven't read A Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde um, by uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, it is, it's, really, it's really cool. But again, it's kind of like watching Friday the 13th for the first time. And you already know that it's not a whodunit. You know what I'm hmm. saying? So it... <clears throat> kind of loses. You can still, you can still enjoy it, though. I think. Oh, you totally you, can. You yeah, totally. it's written so well. So that's just another one of those. Um, what What I like about him as well is the fact that he he can't help liking the violence and all that debauchery kind of thing more and more and more, and that's the bit that goes wrong. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't that. work the way he was hoping it would work. No, it's and kind of... um, the transformations start happening 
without him yeah. um, like doing the potion or whatever. They just start happening. And so shit kind of gets out of hand. But um, And I don't know. Like I like these tragic characters. You know, yeah, I like, do. Like Griffin and Invisible Man isn't as tragic because he doesn't have the same um, like yearning throughout mm. as um, Dr. Jekyll does. But No, it's you know. kind of he's, he's experimenting and then it just gets more and more out of control because you have to keep doing it, doesn't it? Mm. Whereas with Dr. Jekyll, it's like Ojikal, as it was pronounced in Scotland. <sighs> Well, I just read that. I've, I've always called it Jekyll. Aluminium. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I've never called it Jekyll in all my life, but apparently Jekyll was how he pronounced it when he wrote it. Which, is which sounds important. almost scarier than Mr. Hyde. Yeah, I know it does, doesn't it? Jekyll. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I've never That's thought of it like that before. I would never go see a doctor named Jekyll. You yeah. didn't want it, would you? You'd be like, no, no thanks. I'll go and see Dr. Sniffles or something. Sniffles. Well, if you're out here, you're going to go see Dr. Kamaza Habahan. -Habba <laughs> and... <laughs> yeah, it's quite, it's quite varied these days. It's a good no. thing. Right, my number two is Moreau. Really? Mm hmm Is that your number one? That no, that was my original number five. And then the more was I it? got it, I just I didn't like him as a person. I like, don't. I don't like but him as a person. Go ahead, go ahead and talk about it. Um I just think as far as the mad scientist goes, he is pretty much up there. Like, he's, he's creating, he's trying to create a whole new race of people. Irregardless of, if that's a word, regardless of, um... I like irregardless. <laughs> I think I've just merged several words together there. Regardless <laughs> of pain, comfort, all the moral thing behind it, he's just going for it anyway, he does not care. But... I just like the whole concept of someone having such a mad god complex that he is totally oblivious to everything other than his goal, what he wants. Because Complete. he doesn't. Yeah. And, and the thing about it, too, that makes it kind of crap or whatever, or just bonkers, is that there's not a damn good reason to do it other than the fact that he can. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's no it's good reason like, behind it. I have no idea what I'm going to do with this once I get it done, but I'm just going to keep doing it. No, he's just going to lord over everybody. That's it. He's going to create a race of people who will all bow down to him, and he'll be lord of his island with all these people. But, I mean, honestly, like, when you think of the it's logic a total god behind complex. that... Well, it's a total god complex, but, hey, I'm going to totally disfigure you and hurt you and make you in agonizing pain so you will call me God. Like, the whole plot, like, the whole, like, reasoning behind that, like... It's crazy. I would want to be the fly on the wall when he's like, oh, these people are going to love me. <laughs> yeah. They're totally going to help. I'm going to slice them up and then put them back together while they're alive and awake, and they're going to dig this. They're really going to enjoy this. <laughs> Th that that my, puma my... is going to walk on two legs, people. It's going to love me. I'm going to break its knees and put them in the front. My favorite version of this is the Charles Lawton Island of Lost Souls. Have you seen that one? Yes. Yeah, you must have done. Yes. With Bellerin. And the makeup and the... It's so weird and odd. The whole thing, the whole atmosphere and creepiness about it. It's just such a good film. And I think that's why... I particularly like him because he's outwardly, initially, you kind of think, yeah, he's okay, you know, this charming fella and all this kind of thing. And then it's very quickly you realize he has got no morals whatsoever. Well, he is utterly... Talking about that movie, um, 
this is going to sound really stupid, but this is how I rationalize stuff. I don't like him, and I don't like that movie a whole lot because he yeah. was married. He was married to Elsa Lanchester. Oh, right. so I'm like you asshole. Like even though well, like, you're jealous. Yeah, but it's stupid because I'm like I'm jealous of a marriage that happened 70 years ago that was probably <laughs> a sham marriage just so he could be a homosexual and beat the shit out of his wife, you know. But I'm gonna be really pissed off about it and the whole thing. And then the second thing that I found just really strange about that movie is that he dresses like a fucking plantation owner in the South, you know, like. And his Why's white suits and shit. Because it's like, okay, you're you're a mad scientist on an island in the middle of nowhere, but you're dre- you're dressed like you have a freaking um, like plantation house in Louisiana or something like that. It, it's just it was like such a I weird thought that was, look. For I liked it. I thought that was your classic kind of because that whenever you used to watch Tarzan and things like that, it was always like you had people in khaki. You know, with a bit of leopard skin around the hat and the belt and stuff. You know, khaki yeah. well, shorts. Well, basically, t-shirts. what I'm trying to get at is that I couldn't, I can't have a unbiased opinion of. No, I totally, that. I get that, even though it is crazy. <laughs> so I'm saying that would be crazy, <laughs> even though you're completely fucking stupid and wrong. I completely understand. I just think I can. I would like as far as the dress goes and everything is close. That's exactly how I would expect a sort of upper class gentleman to, to be in a hot climate. That's how people used to, that's how I imagine it was all white to, you know, keep cool and, and he was, he wanted to be, like, stand out from everybody else that was there. And he had yeah. creepy facial hair, which you really like. No, I don't like creepy facial hair. You're I like, don't the like the creepier the long. facial hair, the better. <laughs> I'm not actually that big a fan of Charles Lawton as a, as an actor, and certainly not as a character, but I liked him in this because he was unlikable, dislikable. And the did, oh, didn't they do another movie of it with like Val Kilmer and Anthony Hopkins or something? I'm not sure. They did one with Marlon Brando. I know that one. Marlon Brando. One. Okay. Yeah. I, I never saw that. No, I didn't either, but I love the Island of Lost Souls one. Because the, artwork, the artwork for the poster and everything is amazing. So. Yeah, that is true. Okay, so my number one is going to come as no shocker to anyone, <laughs> but um, it's Dr. Victor Frankenstein. Yay! From Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And I just think it's like the 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 birth of the modern mad scientist, you know? Um, oh, God, yeah, totally. So I just... That book was... And, I, I mean, I, it kind of isn't anymore, but, like, I mean, for years, I had that book with me everywhere I went and read it. It was, like, honestly, until I read Breakfast of Champions, Frankenstein was my fucking catcher in the rye. You know, yeah. and um, but he had such a <clears throat> especially in the book, just like the tortured soul of all time, you know completely, yeah, that was what was so it's just so heartbreaking, you mm. know, but um. And I really like the book better when it comes to, um, like, how they find him out on the ice and the whole thing. Like, he, Me too. It's like, he had the monster follow him out there so he wouldn't hurt anyone he loved and there was no one yeah. left and the whole thing. It's just... <clears throat> it's incredible. It's just a great, it's great a powerful story. thing. They're and I mean, she was like, what, novels, six, she was like 14 or 16 when she wrote it. Really young, yeah. She it's really fucking young. crazy. Absolutely crazy. It just isn't bear thinking about when I think what I shitty things I was attempting to do when I was 16. Just laughing. Well, you also weren't like having sex with 
thirty year old poets when you were <laughs> fourteen. <true. laughs> Very true. Couldn't have been less like that if you had tried. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually have as well, just as a side note, I actually have got the um, Bernie Wrightson illustrated version of Frankenstein that I got for my birthday. Oh really? Yeah, with all the Bernie Wrightson panels which fully illustrated all the way through and as I've mentioned on many occasions, he's one of my favourite illustrator probably, or what, definitely one of them. Who's and your number one? I'm still talking about yours. Okay. I'm sorry. I was <laughs> just asking. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, he's done, he's done all the panels for it, and they're so intricate, you wouldn't believe. I don't know if you've ever seen any of them, but there's like him, Frankenstein, Victor, working in his lab, and it'll be like a small character, a Victor at, with the table in front of him with all the vials and stuff and the tubes and pipe work and all that. And then behind are just shelves, like the say two thirds of the panel are just shelves with books and pots and all sorts of bits and bobs up. And it's just every little last tiny minutiae of detail. It's incredible to look at. It's beautiful. The artwork that's gone into it. So Am I boring you? Shall I move on? <laughs> You are in rare form today, dude. I oh, swear to God. Oh, my God. She's really annoyed me. Bless her. Anyway, my number one is Professor Calculus from the Tintin book. <laughs> and as far as favorite stuff, there's no competition as far as I'm concerned. Professor Calculus is um, created by Hergé, who is a Belgian, like, Illustrator, artist. Okay. And he wrote these awesome spy stories, the Tintin book, um, The Adventures of Tintin. The Jay's Adventures of Tintin. And Professor Calculus is basically this. He was based on someone, I haven't written it down. He was an actual person in 1932 or something, an actual scientist. And he looks just like him. I'll try and find a picture for him for the show notes. It's classic. But he's basically this sort of absent-minded little professor who has got um, three PhDs. I've written them down in um, nuclear and theoretical physicist, um, in planetary astronomy and calculus, obviously. He's absent minded professor, he's deaf, so he mishears everything all the time. He's got a great big ear trumpet, which hilarity infused. <laughs> uh, but he's also gen genuinely really clever. He invite, he, through the course of the story, he invents this, an actual moon rocket that gets them to the moon. He invents an ultrasound, what is it? An ultrasound device, and he builds a shark shaped submarine for them to go looking for Red Rackham's treasure under the sea. And he just, he's awesome. But he's such a cool little character in it. I used to love him so much when I was a kid. And I'll never forget him. He's the best. So if you haven't read any of the Tintin books, they're like the coolest. The, the first ones can be a bit iffy as far as racism goes in certain ways. Um, and, he made, yeah, and he made a point as the book developed, like it was only the first couple and then later on there's still stereotypes because they were only written in the 30s um, so that, you know a lot of the views are very different then anyway but it does make reference to things a lot more and people are dressed in much different ways if you know what I mean as it goes along so it's not like offensive well it is it's offensive if you really want to look into it but it's not as far as you know the time it was written in, if you bear that in mind. But Tintin's basically a journalist. You might have seen the film a bit, but he's basically a journalist who keeps stumbling across these um, various different mysteries that he goes and solves with his little dog Snowy um, and his friend Captain Haddock, who's an alcoholic. And the Thompson Taylor. twins. And the Thompson twins, who are from CID or something. One, one's Thompson with a P and the other one's Thompson without a P. 
and they're both identical twins, but you can only tell from the moustaches, one's straight and one's curly, which one's which. <laughs> they're absolutely brilliant. I've got the whole lot and I've read them all over and over and over and over, so I shall be bringing them up at later days to let you know about them more. Okay. So Professor Calculus is my number one. Yeah, if um, we were doing like film mad scientists kind of thing, I would have mm -hmm. definitely picked um, Dr. Pretorius. Is yes, I know. I knew you would. He's batshit crazy, dude. Mm -hmm. oh, so good. Anyway, that was fun. I, I, yeah, that was really I, I good. I threw that a lot easier than I thought I would. Yeah, that was cool. It's always yeah. interesting discussing it. I think, anyway. I don't know if our viewers would agree. <laughs> For realsies. Um, yeah. So now what we're going to do um, is we're going to get into the actual part of the show. So now that we've been on for an hour and a half, um, we are going to um, talk a little bit about writing habits and then talk about the importance of mailing lists. Does that sound good? Sounds really good. Okay. Well, um, through my meandering through... Um, websites and stuff of that nature. I ran across a... Um, let me try to pull it up here. Um, I ran across a... Uh, Can I just say, have we got any comments or anything before you start on that? No, and you know what? Let me just say that the comments are fucked up on Hangouts, so I've been trying to go back and forth to YouTube, and all of the comments are showing up on YouTube, but on Hangouts, they're like there, and then they disappear, and all this other shit. So, um, if you are leaving comments for the live viewers, um, give me a second, because it's uh, taking a while for me to pull them up. But basically, I came across an article from a site called Writer's Relief, and I have not used the services on Writer's Relief, but they basically help you. Um, they, they give free advice and stuff like that, but they also help you get your book out and do all, um, I'm, I'm assuming, formatting and stuff like that for you if you want them to, to do that for you. Is but, that um, writersrelief.com? Um, I believe so. If you just Google Writer's Relief, I'm sure it'll come up. But they, so is, it, is it quite a useful site for people, do you think? Um, I think it could be. I, again, haven't used haven't their services, it. so I don't know um, anything about it, and I don't know anyone who has used their services. So if you have used their services and you had a good experience with it, please let me know. because Yeah, get in uh, touch, because we need it. We need help as much um, as everyone else does with different sources. Always yeah. for help. Yeah. So um, that would be great. But there was an article that they had on their site called Success in Writing, How to Win the Game. And um, basically they have this thing where it's like it's five game-changing skills. Um, give, give yourself a score for each one of these that you have. And if you have all five, you should be doing great. And if you don't, you know what you need to work on kind of thing. So I kind of wanted to go over some of these because um, I found it just kind of um, kind of interesting because for the most part, I do not have hardly any of these. <laughs> so... <laughs> oh, God. So, um, it's just, uh, it was really cool. So the first one is unwavering concentration. And, no, uh, you definitely don't have that. Yeah, okay, so that's really funny. And when I, when I read, I'm going to read this part to you because um, you'll totally understand it. Um, unwavering concentration. A successful writer must be able to focus intently on the writing task at hand. During the time that you set aside for writing, ignore the siren call of social media. Halt those breaking bad binges and stop treating this, the selection of your next Keurig cup flavor as a life or death decision. Oh. In your writing career's future that hangs in the balance, so give your work the attention it deserves. Oh and my I God, say... That is so true. <laughs> you say... Like, <laughs> Too close to home. That is so close to home. You totally don't do any of that. 
Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, the fact that they hit me with the Keurig right there. Yeah, the Keurig, was, the clincher. Was, oh man, but yeah, the Breaking Bad binges, that's you right now, but you're done, so you're okay now. Now you're just uh-huh. fringe, so that's going to be an issue for you. But, yeah, but I'm um, working through it as quickly as possible so yeah. I can get my life back. And honestly, I go through these, like, people talk about how many words they write a day, and I go back and forth. Like, this week I wrote the first seven pa- seven chapters of um, The Girl with the Crystal Pubis. So mm-hmm. it's like, I am writing, but I'm not writing every day, and I need to be writing every day. And, like... So how do you um, think you can... How do you think, going off that first thing... What? If my screen goes to white and you hear a big noise or something like that or goes to black, it's because my hot water heater exploded and shot at me and hit me in the back of the head and my face smashed my computer. Oh, God. Just so you know. That was horrifying. Dude, it's making really funny noises. (laughs) So, um, okay. I'm saying, right, from the first point there, how do you think you could work that into your day? I need to actually, and I think every writer needs to do this, because, I mean, this is going to sound really stupid, but one of the most inspirational things I've ever heard somebody say was from actually Sid Haig. And Sid Haig said, no matter what you do, every day create something. No matter what Mm -hmm. it is, just create every day. And that, that cool. it's just, it's so simple, you know? Yeah. And um, right. what I need to do, what I really need to do is I need to look at writing as a job. Yes, you and do. That's very much I need to get true. up and go, oh, it's 9 o'clock. I need to start writing. And successful writers do that. Yeah. You know, they you go, do. oh, from 9 to 11, I have to write. Let me see how many words I could write in that amount of time or something like that. Even and, if you have, like, literally set yourself those two hours and that's the only two hours you do in the whole day if you actually sat and worked productively for those two hours that would be actually better than what you're doing now where you sit and writing a little bit getting up going making a coffee going and watching the telly a bit coming back oh well, you know, I, mean, I have, you've got to your have daughter. coffee when I'm writing again that's... yes I know but you know what I mean I'm saying getting up and wandering about no, totally. and going no because and... like the thing that honestly fucking fucks me more than anything is goddamn Facebook. Yeah. Facebook, I could, I, I'll get on there and just start like looking around at stuff, liking posts. Da, 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 da. Next thing I know, three hours has gone by. I know. And I haven't I mean, even can... made a status update. I've just been like seeing what everyone's. Oh, I can do that as well, just faffing about looking at stuff. I know. Fuck that. I, so I. I definitely, because like even and when I'm writing for like two hours at a time, I'll do two or three thousand words in that mm-hmm. little two hour period. So if I like sat down and said, okay, well I'm gonna write for eight hours today, like I have a job, or yeah. what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start at like three hours. Yeah, I do. And try too. to do three hours every day for a week, like at least Monday through Friday, and then so. the next week go to maybe four hours and just try to. Because, like, with me, like, writing is always something, like, when it hits, I'll do it. Yeah. And I need... But it might be good to get yourself, like, to force yourself into a routine. I think the thing that's hard for me is that my daughter's getting older and wants to stay up later. And she used to go to bed at 8 o'clock at night. So, like, at 8 o'clock, I would start writing and I'd write until 11 or 12. But now she's staying up till like, 10 or 11 at night. And yeah. totally fucking my shit up. <laughs> I know. But then if she's doing... The thing is as well is because she's homeschooled, isn't she? So she's mm-hmm. not out through the day. That would be your time that people would be getting on. When everyone's gone out of the house, you just sit down and you work. Yeah. But yeah. with your situation, you need to maybe say, right, don't come out of your room for two hours. This is our work time. And we'll come out and have a break in two hours' time. That's a really good way of thinking about it, for yeah. sure. Yeah, so both um, of you are doing it. I think I'm going to do that, uh, because I when um, when I'm doing shows and stuff and she's here, I usually don't do shows when she's around, but, uh, no. like, right now she's not home. But, like, um, typically, yeah, like, she, I make her stay in her room. I'm like, hey, you're in your room, I'm doing my show, or don't bother me, I'm doing a, a show. 
she's got her work to do as well, so she's regimented into that, and she knows well, she's yeah, got a break I mean, at a certain time. To like, is she going to do her work? Yeah, exactly. You know, like, that's a whole if, other fucking That's world. what I mean, though. If she knows that when she comes out at a set time and you're going to check what she's done, you know what I mean? Yeah. For real. Well, the number two thing on here is a protective stance. It says, uh, your writing is your pride and joy, and you should treat it as such. Don't send your work out into the world without paying attention to where it's going and who it's with. If Indiana Jones were trying to steal your work, you would never let him get it, and that's how much it should mean to you. Protect it, cultivate it, adore it, teach it to play smart. Agents and journals will take notice. I totally do not do this. No. It's like, as soon as I'm done writing something, format Amazon. You know, it's like, and I mean, I guess that's kind of the same thing, but it's just like, my whole thing is, is like, I write so much that mm -hmm. if one of my stories gets out or one of my books gets out and it gets pirated, hooray. Because the only reason why anyone's going to pirate some of my shit is because it's in demand. So... No, I know, but I, don't, I think you're right. I think they're right in that that's not a healthy way to look at it. I think that you naturally as a person are quite, um, what's the word? Stupid. No. Risky. No. Apathetic. You can't, you can't hang around. You're agitated. I get what's super word? agitated. And you have to, when you've done something, it's like, right, I've done it, get it out, gone. Yeah. And like you've just said, instead of taking time. I mean, even when we're preparing for this show and stuff, you're like, right, can we go on? Let's go on. And I'm like, yeah, but I've got to do this. And the Friday the 13th show that we do, I'm like, I'm still writing my notes. No, it'll be fine. Let's do it. And it's like fly by the seat of your pants compared to me, who's like... Well, that's the other thing, because like, I don't ever reread my stuff. Exactly. I think and you really need to take time to go through it and be so proud of it before it goes I, out. I am proud of it because it just like is born, and it just like bleh, and it falls out of me. You know. And I'm, yeah, and like, I don't oh, think I, you should. I go through it to edit it, you know, but I'm not like like going through it to read it. I'm just like seeing if like grammar's okay, words are misspelled, or anything like that. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I really don't. Read it. Maybe I think he maybe should try. That's the next point. Like try and be really proud of stuff before you, it goes out. Instead of like quality over quantity. Do you think I'm not proud of my stuff? I think you are, but I think it's more you get on a roll and everything comes out and it's the sort of. Um, getting as much out in the hope that somebody will like one bit of it rather than... I don't think that's the exact reason. I think the reason is, like, because I don't read my scripts before we shoot. I'll write yeah. a script and I'll send it out to everybody and then we get to set and I'm like, I said, what? And, like, I'm like, I didn't write that dirty-ass line, did I? Why, did, why don't you read it? Why because don't if you? you read it, you keep changing stuff. And when I sit down and write something, it just, it flows out, and I just, that's what was created at that exact moment. I mean, imagine if you could do this. Like, okay, let me put, let me paint it like this. You mate with someone and get pregnant, have a baby, mm -hmm. the baby comes out, and you're like, ew, that face is kind of ugly, let me shove it back up in there and let it cook for a couple more hours, and maybe it'll look better. You can't do that with your kids, so why do it with your writing? Like, your writing is who you are right then and there at that exact moment. And then no, but the difference like, is you can, do it. you can do it with your writing. But you shouldn't. Well, I mean, I, I, understand, I, understand, I understand that people do do that, and, you know, that's great and fine. But for me, it's like, if I were to go back and start, like, rethinking stuff and re-editing stuff, nothing would ever fucking get done. Like, it would be a... You, I mean, you could talk to any writer, and they'll tell you, probably, this is me generalizing, that if they could go back to one of their books and change something, they would. And they would always be able to go back and do it if they could. Yeah, I understand that. But at the same time, I'm saying, how, would you, how do you know that 
from the way, I understand that the way that you write and the way it, it's created just comes out and you want it to be like that on the paper. That's how you want it to come across to people, that it's come out of your head like that in that form. But at the same time, there's nothing wrong with going through and tweaking it and making sure that it's accessible or that the, do you know what I mean? How well, do you know? There's nothing wrong with that, but it's just not something that I do. And I don't know if I want to do that. You know? Well, that's like, fair enough. But if it's not, if it's working for you that way, then carry on. But it but might be worth working? trying it. Are, are, you, are you giving me a hint like, Ooh, your stuff isn't that good. You should probably... No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm <laughs> saying, are you happy with the way it's going? Because if you're happy with the way it's going, then fine. But if you're not, then that's possibly a way to change it. You're all, you do realize you said penis leg and bacon, right? <laughs> <laughs> I understand that, though. I understand that there's very different ways. That, I'm not a writer, so I don't know. But I know for a fact that people, everybody's different in the way that they create stuff. So, I know that my dad's written a book and it took him forever because he went over and over and over and over until he was happy with it because he's, you know, that's just the way he is. He's a control freak. Yeah, Jim just said, I hate revising as you tend to end up endlessly faffing about. The trick I found is to write, then leave it, come back to it a few weeks later, and then do an edit. That's kind of how I was trying to be with, um, yeah. with uh, like a Black Star Canyon and um, the roommate when I was finishing the Creepology thing. And mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, I came back to that like six years later. But um, even with the Bloodlust Romance edits and stuff. But what I've noticed is like every week I start writing something new, and because like I haven't scheduled my time correctly, mm -hmm. when I, it's time to go back to re-edit something, I'm already writing something else. You know, because, yeah. like, I sat down to start working on Black Star Canyon, and then I ended up writing seven chapters of The Girl with the Crystal Pubis. So it's yeah. like... Um, but that's okay, because if you, were doing, if you were doing a set number of quality hours every day, you would have time to do different stuff and go back to stuff that you'd written last week or the week before, or, you, do you know what I mean? You'd be able yeah. to schedule it more constructively. It's the fact that you do it, and then you come back to it, and it, you've completely changed what you're wanting to write about then. And that you'll probably go back to Black Star Canyon, but because there's such a gap in between when you're writing at the minute, because there's so much other stuff going oh, I on. I want Black Star Canyon done. I want the yeah. first season done. Because that's going to be the big funnel. That's going to be the that's going to be the fun one, dude. Okay. Yeah. Well, so that's number two. Okay. Um, I think this here. is good. It's useful. Yeah. Number three is proper training. It may seem obvious that you have to spend a lot of time and energy honing your craft in order to be successful, but there are many people who expect that acceptances will just drop into their laps. Trust us. That's not how it happens. Make sure you're prepared, uh, read lauded pieces of writing, write constantly, study grammar and composition, make sure that your writing is in its best shape it's ever been. You need to become an ultimate writing machine, mechanically efficient, while philosophically omniscient. So um, that is just something that you have to keep doing. That's not something that you either are or you aren't. You know, that's like you have to stay in practice, you have to keep reading, you have to keep writing. And one of my problems is, is I'm trying to read more, and I'm trying to read more from various places, and not just, well, like, I'll... read all my Kurt Vonnegut books over again, you know, or all my H.G. Wells. Like, I'm trying to pick and grab from here or there, <clears throat> and read as much as I can. But, um, I don't know. Um... But it might not harm you as well to do grammar stuff. Do you know what I mean? Do find a book on it and learn about it. Do you know what oh, I mean? Oh, and try sure. There's that's a ton another of thing. I'm sure people. About. Yeah, and and just different new styles, like in ways of you know phrasing a sentence and stuff. You know, mm -hmm. it might add a different thing to how you write. It might 
like expand everything. So you think, oh yeah, that like a particular style might might really appeal to you. Hey Jim, do you know of any place like that, like any book or website or anything like that that you found that's helped you hone grammar and all that other stuff? Listen That'd to me really talking useful. like I'm not making any fucking sense. You know, hone and grammar or anything. <laughs> hone and grammar and shit. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, the, the fucking first line is gonna be adjectives and curse words are not the same thing. <laughs> um. <laughs> you see, I find it actually quite scary when I um, look through, you know, sort of stuff at school level grammar. And I think I've got quite a good handle on grammar and all that kind of thing and spelling and, and I think, oh my god, that's what? And I don't even, like Nicola, my friend, is, you know, she used to be a primary school teacher and she comes out with all these stuff and about all the pronouns and adjectives and all that kind of thing and it starts off okay but there's so much more to <laughs> it that I've kind of no. chosen to forget. Yeah, I mean, there's times when I'm, because I homeschool Shaylee and stuff, and everything's yeah. cool, everything seems to be going okay, and then all of a sudden, like, something will come up, I'm like, no, that's wrong. And she's like, no, Dad. I'm like, no, that is wrong, that is not right. <laughs> she's like, no, Dad, and I'm like, look, and I'll grab her book, and I'll look through it, and I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm just testing you, you know, making sure you're on top of it. I mean, usually that happens in math, but... Um, oh, God, it, yeah. It has happened, um on one occasion I could think of in her literature. But, yeah, uh, it's, it's tough. You know, there's so much to know. So the more you read, even a basic, I know it sounds stupid, but even like a secondary school or something, um, workbook, you would probably learn all the basics again. And it's not that you don't know it, it's reminding yourself of all the stuff that you've done before, because I certainly can't remember it. Yeah. And it's yeah. really useful, even for writing blogs and stuff. You, it's the first thing that's irritating when you look on a blog when people are just writing stuff and everything's a mess. You know what I mean? For and real. And, you know, it just automatically gives you a tone that you you are reading it in without actually taking the content in. Now, um, number four on here is um, knowing the rules. And it says, it's important to be familiar with all the steps involved in making submissions, know the right formatting, be sure your work is carefully proofread, then do your research and find out what journals agents go for, and all that other stuff. Now, the thing with this is, um, this is, again, talking more like if you're um, sending your manuscripts out to publishers and agents yeah. and stuff. And obviously, Absolutely. since we're doing self-publishing, we don't run into that. But, I mean, the rules apply, and I think... Um, where it talks about um, All the knowing your formatting and carefully proofread. The thing that's irritating to me, and I know this happens to everyone because everyone I talk to has this problem, they'll give it to an editor, the editor edits the book, gives it back to you, you start looking at it, and then you start finding problems in there still. And you get pissed off, especially if you paid the editor to do this. And I know people who paid like really expensive editors to edit their book, and it comes back, and there's still fucking grammar fuck ups and all sorts of shit in the book. So that is like a really um, tricky thing. And a, a, another thing that's really funny is if you have someone in Britain um, edit your book. <laughs> I could tell you were going to say something bad about me there because no, you're no, no, no. working. No, all of a sudden words come back with OU in them, and you're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and then you pull, pull it up in your doc, and it's like, oh, yeah, this is still wrong. I'm like, no, that's how you spell color. That's how you spell flavor. You know, that's how this is going. And um, so, yeah, so that's some good times. But um, so there's that. And then the last thing is a positive outlook. Um, I think uh, for the most part, this is the only one that I have. And, yeah, you most definitely do. I mean, I don't have a super positive outlook, but I think um, the fact no, that... No, you can't... You re you're reserved, but I would say you're optimistic about things. Yeah, we, we all but agree yeah, on that. But I think the word to describe you probably most accurately is impatient. 
I'm very impatient. I'm impatient with everything. And even when yeah. I'm shooting a movie, if the movie shoot lasts more than four days, I'm ready to kill somebody. I know. Um, this, is a, this is a thing that I think... I mean, whoever we've talked to about about publishing and books, all that kind of side of things, patience is the main thing, isn't it? Just sitting back and letting the audience accumulate slowly well, over time. Well, I think it's rare that things just... What I honestly you know, think, I think people get patience and being stagnant confused. Yeah. And the I last thing I want to ever do is stagnate on anything. And I do not want to be, I, I never want to just be accepting of a plateau. Like that's not, it's so funny because in my work life, I have this like fucking like go get him attitude and all this shit. But then in my human life, it's like you could call me platy plateauerson, you know? <laughs> like I'm like, oh, there's rotten milk in the fridge. Eh, it'll figure itself out. Trash needs to go out. Yeah, it'll go out. Dumpster's right there. But you know, I'll just go. Eh, yeah. You know, I got to do I'll laundry get, today. Eh. Yeah. I'll get round to it. <laughs> totally. It's like you all know that. But what I'm saying is, is I don't think you could ever worry about the fact that you're just sitting on your laurels, like, waiting for things to happen, because you're constantly thinking about new stuff. There's new Slasherton books coming out. You've got all sorts of projects of yours that you're doing, and you've got all your film stuff on top of all that. You know, but I think... It's difficult for anybody to sit back and wait for stuff to catch on. Because you're, I mean, you as in generally, we're proud of our books, aren't we? And, and confident about them. I know that sounds big headed, but we are. Like, no, I'm really proud if of you them. Can't, yeah. You can't put a book out that you think is shit, you know? No, like, exactly. And, like, I have confidence that eventually they'll catch on and they're going to be something big, you know what I mean? But yeah. it is that frustrating in the meantime, so I think that's the main thing that you're saying is quite true, that you just you just have to keep creating. Like Sid says, things have to keep coming out, the new books have to keep, keep coming out so people don't get a chance to get bored and to forget about them. That's yeah. the main thing. Well, um, considering that I kind of just, like, plagiarized that site's article, please, if you're watching this or listening to this, go to Writer's Relief, uh, I guess, .com, and kind of see what they have since I used their shit on the show. It's um, okay. If you mention who they are, yeah. you can go check That's out. okay, right? Yeah. I said Keurig, you know? Yeah, let's hope you get one. <laughs> It's so funny. I was reading um, one of the reviews for free Kindle books on Amazon, and um, somebody put, like, in big caps, like, what are the MIB going to do with his Keurig? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I, it's just it's fun. and um, That's really cool. I'm going to just ask right now. I'll ask again, but I just want to make it clear how important it is for people to comment on um, the Amazon stuff. Like, if you've purchased any of our books um, or even got them for free or whatever and you like them, can you please go on there and um, leave a comment? It's really important, especially in the first, like, you know, couple weeks of um, a book launch to make sure you're putting comments up there and saying what you think about the book because that will boost the book's rating and the popularity list and keep it up there. So um, just if, if you like what we do or anything like that, throw us a bone and please give us a comment um, on the books. And <clears throat> alternatively, if, you, if you're doing something and you want us to help you out with it, then we'll see what we can do as well as far as reviews go and stuff. It's all about sharing with each other and good reads is an awesome way of doing that, isn't it? To go over oh, and to, sure. to discuss each other's stuff and all of just, just different things that you like and things. It's a great community. I haven't been there for ages. I really need to get back over there because 
you find all sorts of stuff that yeah, you find all find new reads for sure. Yeah, but your friends and people who you know recommend and things like that. Well, oh, I just I've got, got a, a comment from Jim, and then it disappeared. Oh. So let me see if I can find it on YouTube. Why is it disappearing? It's so I don't annoying. know, man. Okay, Jim said, best grammar honing is reading it aloud, or better still, getting someone else to read it aloud to you. That'll give you a good idea if your commas and periods are in the right places. As for shit like semicolons, I go with what Vonnegut said. A semicolon is just a comma that's been to college. I totally agree, and it's so funny. <laughs> I, mean, I, I use semicolons all the time, and um, every time I do it, I, 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 I'll be typing, and I'll do a comma, and I'll go, no, this is way more of a semicolon. Uh, it's so funny because I put my hands up on my keyboard as soon as I started talking about semicolons. I'm like, oh. I know. <laughs> and I'm like, no, this, this is way more... A semicolon bit. See, I'll fully admit now, I don't actually, I sort of know when you use a semicolon and a colon, but I couldn't technically describe it and be 100% confident that I was right. And this is the, these are the things that you kind of need to know back to front, really. Yeah. No, and I think it's, I, I don't want to say it's, it's so objective classic. because it's, it's not technically objective, but there's times when, um, I'm trying to think of a sentence I've just written or something like that that I could use in this example. But if um, I'm saying, like... Because <clears throat> I'm, I'm the king of run-on sentences. I like to just keep going and going and going. So if I'm uh, typing something well, out or... You going... also do a lot of very short sentences, just as a statement. I've noticed that. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll do something like... Like... Um, no, I, I know what you're saying. I because I, I when I was doing the book um, the other day when I was writing, I, I would notice that it would be like this person does this and this and that and whatever. New sentence, really dark. Yeah. New sentence, really dark. Yeah. And then it's like then the rest of the paragraph is one sentence, and it's like so he went in the room and turned on the light. I can't even give you an example right now. This is no, boring. I know what you mean, though. It's very yeah. stylized, the particular way of doing it. No, but okay. yeah, so that might annoy the shit out of everyone. It definitely. No, I'm not saying that. I'm that saying I, I think it's quite a cool. It seems like a quite modern way of doing it. It's certainly not an old, um, an old-fashioned style. From reading like a lot of the classics and stuff, that's a completely different style of writing. But it's cool. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Semicolons are. Fucking commas that went to college. That is it's so. It's exactly funny. right. <clears throat> They're fancy. Yeah, They're I think I, I, I honestly don't think it would be a bad idea <laughs> to get um like a secondary school like textbook. A secondary school. That's high school, right? Yeah, high school textbook. You know, and just go through the thing. <laughs> I should probably start at fifth grade, and um, kind of. That, that's primary. I would seriously if it was yeah. me. That's what I would do. I mean, I have. We should do that just for fun and just see like how. Not Why don't we? we are. Because I guarantee um, that. We, let's do that on the next show. We'll we'll get like some like super primary elementary school um, grammar book and start going through it and go. Did you know that? <laughs> exactly. Seriously, but to also to test people who were watching me as well, you know what I mean? And see what they think, because I bet you it's surprising how much we take for granted, which, I mean, when you see on Facebook and stuff, the grammar, everybody's grammar and spelling, shocking, including yeah. mine. You know, I'm always messing up and then thinking, oh, God damn it, I've done it and typed it and pressed go, and you can't do anything about it then. I know, and I have a feeling that, that um, smileys and winkies... Um, aren't real grammar. No, they're totally not. I was writing an email to someone, and I put LOL in the letter in the email, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. That's horrible. So that social media creeping into our lives. <laughs> Lol. Yeah, so that's that. Um, so if you have any questions, you know, let us know about that. Not that we would be able to answer any of them, obviously. But well, we can now. 
Oh no, not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the other thing I want to talk about is mailing lists, and um, mailing lists are really, really important. And I kind of didn't know how important it was until we started doing mailing lists. And um, it's kind of a thing where your mailing list should be like the first attack whenever you're putting a new book out or anything like that. It should be mm -hmm. the first blow that you strike on making sure people know about what you're doing. But the most important thing is that the people who are on your mailing list should be people who give a fuck about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that you should never do and is actually illegal is to just add people's names to an email list. Without getting their permission. Without getting their permission. Yeah. So um, make sure you don't do that. But... Um, the Which is tempting because it's really difficult to get people. For some reason, people are really... You'd think it would be quite simple to just sign up. But that, even me, you know, the sites and things that I go to that I really like, and it'll say, join up for our newsletter. And I'll think, oh, I'll do that tomorrow. Or I'll do that. And for some reason, it's like a big deal. And I don't know why. Well, I've been actually... Um, I, I never signed up for newsletters before. No. And in the last, like, six months, I've been signing up. If there's any site I go to that I'm just even remotely interested in, I'll sign up for it just to see what kind of content they have in their mailing list. Because some people's mailing lists are, they'll send something out just when something new is coming out. And you'll never right. hear from them other than that. Or there's people who will send you a newsletter every week. And we're kind of on, <clears throat> on the in-between on that because with the Slasherton Gorzette, which is the Slasherton newsletter, it's very, like, tightly honed into just Slasherton stuff. Yeah. And so it, it, we don't do it as often as I do my Creeper Crew newsletter thing. Because we do it monthly, don't we? Do we try and do it monthly? We, we do it monthly, at least. Every yeah. once in a while it'll come out more than um, once a month if, like... For instance, like it, we put it out twice this month because the Slasherton Origins ebook was free, mm -hmm. and then um, we did the uh, the Movember thing. Yeah. So we did it twice this month. But like with the Creeper Crew news, it's like since I have so much stuff, I'm either doing talking about movies or books or music or podcasts or web shows or whatever. That is a, a real thick, chunky newsletter. And so in both of those newsletters, what we're trying to do is we're, we're putting exclusive content in each one. So in the Gorzette, you have Saks blog. So every time we do it, we'll, we try to do a little exclusive panel that you can only get from the newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, and in this one was Harry Sack for Movember because <laughs> it's the... He has a mustache, you know, good times. It's really cute, actually. <laughs> and then with um, with the Creeper Crew newsletter, I have um, the serial, the true horror story serial. So, yeah. like, every week when that goes out, um, there's an, another, like, four or five hundred words of this story. Ongoing story. <clears throat> and, it's, and it's something that I've written over years that I always go back to and just add a little bit to. And um, it's pretty dirty in some points. I don't know if anyone's read um, the last bit, but <clears throat> there is a uh, giant penis-shaped cannon that shoots stuff out of it. And there's horses oh, and cows that are shooting lasers out of their asses. And um, <laughs> so... If, if that if that sounds interesting at all, you should definitely <laughs> sign up for it. But um, it's How crazy. It? Cause, like, but, like, where you put it, because, like, I know writers are supposed to have blogs, and I go back and forth between my blog and my website, but I know there's writers out there that are, like, I write in my blog, like, three, four, five times a week, you know? Mm. And I'm having a hard time just updating my website. 
So I spend a lot of time on Facebook and a lot of time on Twitter. Well, not even nearly as much time on Twitter as I used to. But um, I don't even think I have my subscribe to my newsletter on my Facebook page. I know we have the Gorzette on the Slasherton page. Yeah, I don't think you have to, you know. Yeah. You so need to get just, that link to it. i got to get that link up there. But um, another thing... Do you, you think should... that, do you think that the blog, like having a blog, would make that much difference now? I don't know. I have I know. a blog, and I don't get a lot of traffic on it, but I don't get a lot of traffic on it because I don't update it regularly. Yeah. So it's like... I it's, don't know if the newsletter... You kind of, well, I don't know. Maybe you should do all of them. I don't know whether we, we could do with some feedback about that, really. But then it goes to, you, like, what's serving your time better, writing? Yeah, or and what's marketing? overkill as well, yeah. So that's, like, one of my big questions that I, I'm never 100% on because everything's always in flux here. So, like, I'll try something, and if I don't see results, like, within a month, I'll try to change it up a little bit. But, um... I don't know. It's it's a weird, a weird thing. But other places that you should have your mailing list, and this is something that I haven't been doing great at. But in um, your books, especially if it's an ebook, you should have a clickable link right there because mm -hmm. someone just finished your book. You know what's the best thing they could do at that exact moment if they like that book, if they read through the whole thing, make sure you fucking tie them down to be able to hear about every other goddamn thing you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I have it in my books, but I think it's too cluttered. Like, um, after you read the book, there's all this other shit, and there's a fucking a thousand different links and all this other crap. I need we to have fucking page, point that out. We have a page, don't we, at the back of our Flasherton books with all the different addresses on, but I don't think they, they're not... Do they link on the ebook? No, we haven't. We haven't been able to fucking master. No, that's tricky, isn't it? We uh, couldn't work book. out the formatting for that. I think we need to change the back page anyway. I think it should be a lot simpler. Yeah. Because I if do. you go to flasherton.com, you can find all of that shit that we yeah, have. Yeah, we just we anyway. just need to have flasherton.com at the bottom, I think, and maybe a little panel a little tiny picture in the middle of something. And Sev, have say something about the gorzette too. Maybe draw yeah. a little picture of a newsstand and like yeah, something like that with a newspaper that says gorzette on it or something. Make or it just have the title, just have the title for the gorzette in the back. You know, the, the head of it we have for the gorzette. You have yeah. that, a little, yeah. a little one of that and then the Washington website. That would be better. Yeah. I mean, you have to tell people to... I think what we need to do in the Slasherton books is say, if you like this, please go to Amazon and rate this book for us. It means the world to us. And tell your friends. Um, and then go to Slasherton.com to sign up for the Slasherton Gorzette. I think if we just say those two things, we're... Yeah doing our thing. But I think you need to actually tell people to do stuff and let them know that it's helpful to you. Yeah, I you know. do as well, because a lot of people don't realize how useful that is. You know what I mean? It's the same with iTunes reviews and stuff for people. Oh podcasts. my god, dude. You know? I'm so f let me just say, once this gets up on iTunes, if people don't start fucking rating this goddamn <laughs> show on there, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> I am so... Fucking livid. Creepers and Cast, I've been doing forever. People, whenever I think no one's listening anymore, I'll make some comment on Facebook or something, and all these people are like, oh my god, da -da 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 -da. So people are obviously listening to the goddamn show. I see on FeedBurner how many times it gets downloaded. I see how many subscriptions I have. How come these people can't fucking go on and take <laughs> two seconds out of their day and say, well, I tell you what, why is good? <laughs> Why don't you just insult everybody? That'll make them want to go and uh, review all your stuff, won't it? Just go and shout at them all. That's the, the first thing they'll do is be like, oh yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> just shout at them. <laughs> so, but and, yes, it is. You know, we would like it if you would comment on our stuff. So yeah. It would but, be uh, greatly appreciated. Greatly appreciated. 
Um, <clears throat> let's see. We use MailChimp, and mm-hmm. I know there's other ones that um, I know I the guys it. that do write uh, write publish repeat. They use a Weber, you know. So I know there's other ones. I've just only used Mailchimp, and you you like Mailchimp, right? I do. I find it quite complicated, but I find everything technical complicated. Do you have you looked at the other ones? Mailchimp, yeah. Mailchimp is very user friendly. I think. Is it? Yeah. I was going to say because you're the one who does the the um, newsletter and stuff, and you seem to be able to do it quite easily and get all the information that you need and we never have problems with it, do we? It no. just does it. And then it comes up on all your feeds. It comes up on, on your Facebook, on my pages, on Twitter and everything, doesn't it? To let people yeah. know. Yeah. So it's automatically without me having to do it. So that's good. It does so, kind of... <clears throat> if you are watching this, you and along. have not joined our mailing list, um, again, go to slashin.com to sign up for the Gorsette. Um, there's a thing the at the bottom page. of the page, or the Facebook page. Um, at the bottom of the page on the website, there's like a sign-up form. We do not share your information with anybody. La, 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 la. MailChimp is very secure. Um, and then um, to get the Creeper Crew news, just go to creeperson.com or... Yeah, just we'll just leave it at that. Go to creeperson.com, and there's a sign-up form at the bottom of that page, too. Does, um, if Jim's still watching, do, does... Do you have um, a newsletter, Jim? Do you use one, and if so, or have you done in the past or whatever? And just if you've got any input about that, because it's quite... We don't... I don't know. I don't know if anybody has a huge amount of... We just seem to find it quite difficult to get people to sign up to it, and you think if well, there's free information, it's why weird. would it the, be a problem? I think the Slasherton one... Here's the thing. The Slasherton one obviously is not as big as the Creeper Crew one. Yeah. But I think the people who've signed up for the Slasherton one are people who are going to buy the next book when it comes out. Yeah, they're loyal. They're books. super loyal. I have way more people on the Creeper Crew one, but probably only 10% of the people on there will actually buy something if I say, hey, the new book's yeah. out, go buy it. You know? Yeah. So, and I'm trying That's to <laughs> get those numbers better. But I know what you mean. Yeah, it's, again, it's quality over quantity, isn't it? You need people on there who are actually going to do it, rather than just sign up people who yeah, are going to read yeah. it and just go kind of thing. Because I mean, just having <laughs> names on a mailing list does shit for you, unless they're yeah, actually I know they've got want to do want want your shit and really care, you know. And if I I don't know, I do you think doing the Creeper Crew one every week is overkill? Do you think the Creeper Crew one has too much information in it. I think if you if it's got that that much information, you need to do it often. Otherwise, it would be absolutely massive, wouldn't it? If you left it and did it monthly, it would be too much information. Oh to my god, it would be fucking. It would yeah, be huge. So but then at the same I time, do I need to tell everybody that? I mean, I what? I have Twitter, I have Facebook, like. People will eventually hear. No, I mean, okay, I'm starting to contradict myself. The, the mailing list is important. I'm just trying to figure out if, because the, the slash fun- one is so direct. It's like this is yeah. exactly what's happening. This is when it's happening. This is what we're doing. Bam. And the creeper crew news is just like I like. It would be nice if I wasn't doing. Okay, God, now I'm sounding like a douchebag. Um, it would be nice if I wasn't doing as much stuff. God, I can't believe that those words just came out of my mouth. I sound like a pompous fucking ass, but like... You sound like a big head. Big, oh. massive, giant head. Do I really? Is that what you think I no. sound like right now? <laughs> oh my god, you don't. But what, the point oh. that you're trying to make is you're doing a lot of stuff in different areas. So maybe you need to do different... Either cut down the amount of information that you put in or split it up. I'm trying to actually make it more personal because before yeah. I was just using like the boxes that MailChimp gives you and yeah. having like, oh, this is this, this is this, this is this, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm like trying to like go, hey, everybody, how's it going? You know, like... I think that horns, makes a lot of sense. Have horns. 
I think it's got to be personal. I think that's yeah. a huge thing because you're you're appealing to people who are specifically wanting to know about stuff and who you're letting in for exclusive information, you know, because yeah. they want to know more than a general information. So you've got to put more effort into it than you would for a normal general thing. But the point is you're putting all the information that you're talking about, you're putting it on your site in theory. So maybe you need to be updating the site. You know, I'm not I'm not updating my site nearly enough. There's shit exactly. in, in the last mailing list that is not even on the website yet. That's that's what I'm saying. I think maybe you need to put more effort into updating the site more and then you can just do the highlights. <laughs> God, I would so much rather write than fucking update a website. Do you know what <laughs> I mean? So I know. Right now, I'm just like. I know. Uh, but no, I mean it's it's good. It's what you're supposed to do. And no, uh, but I'm saying a newsletter should be just like small chunks of useful information to update people. Do you think having the like the free content in the newsletters is good? Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I think that's the best part of it. Okay. And I think that's the best, I think that's the bit that people appreciate because they're getting something that no one else is getting by signing up. It's exclusive stuff. But then at the same time, the fact that we post it up on fucking Twitter and Facebook, then everyone gets it. So... Should we is putting it up on Facebook and Twitter um, taking away from That's people? That's a good point, up? actually. Yeah. Why are we putting it up everywhere if it's an exclusive place? Well, let's do this. How about the next this next month in December? We won't post this. We'll we'll post. Hey, there's a new newsletter. Make sure you sign up for it. Yeah. But we totally. won't put it up. And see That's a really good point. Get. I never even thought of that because why would they sign up? They're getting it anyway. Yeah. Are we thick or what? It's not that we're thick. We're just trying to figure out the best way to do something. And like I noticed because you can see where your clicks come from and all that shit. And I've noticed that we have had a lot of click throughs from Facebook. You know. So. Yeah. You see, I think to get people to look at it, they need to just have the hint. It's like. You know, you put your show notes about the show that coming, you know, upcoming show. But like you were saying, you don't go into detail and tell them everything that you've talked about because people aren't going to listen to the show then, are they? That's the same yeah. concept. Yeah. No, it's, we'll do that. We'll do that. That'll be good. Yeah, I think so too. <clears throat> so, um, in a recap here, um, let us know what mailing list you're using and how successful you are with the mailing lists. Um, it would be nice to hear how that goes. Um, again, and how you and how you go about um, getting a useful audience. You know, like a, a loyal audience. For sure. Sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. Um, and then, uh, so if you haven't already signed up for our mailing list, again, slashin.com or creeperson.com for either one of those, and. Um, I guess, uh, I don't know if there's anything else. I mean, go to podcast451.com for uh, older episodes or the audio for the episodes, and I'll get the rest of these up this week. And, um, <clears throat> oh, um, you know what we didn't talk about? I mean, it's not really about this, but um, the Friday the 13th podcast that Zoe and I are doing, um, on December 13th, we're having a um, viewing party, a live we're either going to do it on Skype or Hangouts um, where we're going to all get together and watch Friday the 13th 1 and 2 um, together as a group and just have a big fun party online with it. Um, and on that same day, um, our second episode will air. So if you haven't heard the first episode, it's broken up into two parts at Friday the 13th podcast.com. Um, and then the new Jalo Chow Chow, we're recording Tuesday night, and we're doing it on Torso, um, the Sergio that Martini. Come out that's going to come out. It'll probably come out Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Yeah. So Sorry, I put it in there. It's about Torso, isn't it? Sergio yeah. Martini. 
So that's what's going on. And I just said Sergio Martini. <laughs> I think I want a glass of booze. It's okay. I said Sergio Fritos because I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm a little peaked. I'm a little a little peckish, eh? A little peckish. That's the word I'm looking for. Grammar Nazi. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah. So, is there anything else? No, I think we covered everything. I think okay. we've done good all, this week. We've all a lot of our books. Stuff. We we did, and I really want to get back to making sure we do that. So yeah, um, December 5th, again, Write, Publish, Repeat comes out. Make sure you pick that up. And um, all of our books, the Slasherton books, and um, my books are on sale through the month of December. Awesome. Okay? I yeah, I think that's everything. All right, so cool. thanks so much to everybody for watching. Thank you, guys. Really Thank appreciate you, Jim. you joining in. Thanks ever so much, Jim. Oh wait, hang on. I find increasing increasing that people I'm in touch with are more and more using social messaging rather than email. Oh, yeah. I never I never and wait, what does he say? I never an email list. I general generally rely on announcing stuff through the blog, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Pinterest. We don't yeah. do Tumblr or Pinterest. Maybe we should do those. Yeah, maybe we should do those. Because Tumblr is quite useful, I think. It just keeps popping up. I don't even know what the fuck it's, it is. It's just another... It's like... Is it like Instagram? It's a bit like Instagram, but with words as well. You can... You know... <laughs> It's loads Instagram of people with use, words. Loads of people use it. So that's another thing, you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's just another four hours of my day. Sucked up. <laughs> so, I'll need to uh, do that then. Oh, God. Oh, good Lord. Okay. So um, thanks, Jim. And Thanks uh, very much, Jim, for all your input. You're always very helpful to have around, isn't he? Totally. Yeah, I love Jim. I love Jim. Oh, okay. They're fighting each other and screaming. I can hear them. Oh shit! <laughs> we should probably <laughs> end the show. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should. Okay, so until next week. Oh shit! <laughs> until next week, we're signing off. <laughs> so it's okay, goodbye guys. from me. Go go publish something. Okay. Bye. Bye. What was that? At? <laughs> so, I was going to say, I'm supposed to say, and it's goodbye, this is what the two Ronnies used to do, and it's goodbye from me, and you saying it's goodbye from him. You get it? Yeah. Like, it's and it's me, goodbye from you, him. But you said it's goodbye from her, because that like, makes it more awesome. Okay. Okay, let's try that. Let's go. Okay. Okay, so until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from her. <laughs> That's so lame. Bye, everybody. See ya. <laughs> <laughs>